Okay, I know some of you are thinking, I must surely be crazy. Diabetes has been the health scourge of this generation, and here I am saying that any and every diabetic can see victory in the fight to overcome it. How could I say such a thing? Surely I must be either irresponsible or stupid or a con man or given to incredible hyperbole. But before you assign me to the intellectual funny farm, I ask you to hear me out for the next few minutes. And then if you want to throw stones, go ahead. Before we go any further, let's think about why diabetes is such a scary and dangerous thing. Some of you have recently been told you are diabetic, and it nearly scared you to death. So why is that? Why do people fear diabetes so much? Well, the answer is they have a good reason to fear it. Diabetes can do tremendous damage to your body. It can destroy your kidneys and put you on dialysis for the rest of your life. It can demolish your circulation until you get gangrene in your feet and legs and force you to have your legs cut off. It can eat away at your vision until you can barely see. It can lop off decades of your life. It can give you heart disease that you would never have if you were not diabetic. Diabetes can indeed be very, very bad news for anyone. Type 2, type 1, type 1 and a half, or LADA. Any kind of diabetes is terrible, and to make matters worse, many doctors are going to tell you, now not all, but many, they're going to tell you diabetes is chronic and progressive. In other words, you're in bad shape now, and it's only going to get worse with every year that you age. Your prospects seem bleak indeed. But there is some wonderful news in this area, and the news is this. Your diabetes does not have to get worse. In fact, it can get better. You can have more victory over diabetes at the age of 60 than you had at 40. In fact, it can get so much better that you can move from being diabetic and having a diabetic A1C to a non-diabetic A1C from diabetic fasting glucose to non-diabetic fasting glucose. And for many, this happens in a matter of a few months, and for most, in less than a year. So, let's take a look at why diabetes is so incredibly damaging to your body if it goes unchecked and you make no efforts to change the lifestyle that led you to the precipice of destruction. Diabetes harms people as a result of two things toxically high glucose, and toxically high insulin. Until recently, the glucose got all the attention. Diabetics were given fasting glucose tests and A1Cs to determine if they were in a safe range. If their glucose was too high, they were at risk for all the diabetic complications mentioned earlier. If it was on the lower side, doctors would be satisfied that their patients were doing about the best they could, and they would try to encourage them, even though they knew in their hearts that these unfortunate men and women were still on the path to destruction, but at least they had slowed down the pace a bit. Many doctors were completely satisfied to see their patients' A1Cs somewhere in the sevens, which researchers agree is not at all good for you. The truth is this, consistently high and abnormal blood sugar is destroying you one day at a time. Now, you can sometimes live for decades with it, but eventually it will wear you down and you will pay a high price for those numbers that show up on your glucose monitor in the mornings. You know, numbers like 145, 185, 255, and into the 300s, 400s, and sometimes even the 500s. God has designed your blood sugar levels to revolve right around 100 milligrams per deciliter sometimes going a bit higher after a meal and sometimes dropping a bit lower as you sleep. Typically, a healthy glucose range will shift somewhere between the 80s to about 130. And this is what most of us experienced when we were teens, and we probably lost somewhere in our 20s. Having consistently high glucose levels is like taking small doses of poison, it's not going to kill you immediately, but it will do you a world of harm eventually. By definition, all diabetics battle high glucose levels. All type 1s, type 2s, LADAs, type 1 and a half, everybody struggles with glucose levels. Type 1s take insulin and try to match their insulin to the meals that they eat as well as injecting slow-acting insulin every day. 
You might suppose this would be a fairly easy thing for them to do, simply match their insulin with their meals and stay in a normal range every day. But in truth, most type 1s don't experience that at all. They see surges and spikes of blood sugar that can jump past 200, sometimes past 300. And at other times, they'll inject too much insulin and they'll experience plunges in their glucose called hypos that can cause them to pass out or sometimes even die. Type 2s typically try to control their diabetes through diet, exercise, medications, and limiting their sugar. But they don't usually do any better than the type 1s. Many take their medications faithfully, and they try to watch their sugar, but they still have A1Cs of 8, 9, 10, and higher. And with blood glucose like this, they are headed for disaster. The sad truth is that most diabetics are not in control of their glucose, and they find that their experience is just what their doctor has told them. They are living in a diabetic condition that is both chronic and progressive. In other words, they're getting worse and worse, and nothing seems to help. Okay, what I've just told you so far is fairly non-controversial. Almost everybody would agree with that, I would think. But there is another problem with diabetes that is not spoken of nearly so much, and that is excess insulin. Many type 1 diabetics continue to eat high-carb, high-starch, high-sugar diets. Some still eat pastries, bread, and sugary desserts. And then they hope to make up for it by simply taking more and more insulin. But excess insulin is just about as damaging and deadly as excess blood sugar. In order to desperately try and corral their glucose, they end up taking massive amounts of insulin, which is something your body was never meant to endure. And living in a state of insulinemia, which is simply excess insulin floating around in your bloodstream day after day, month after month, year after year, that condition would be terrible for them, even if they had their gluco glucose down, which most of them do not. Type 2s, likewise, often are dealing with a tremendous insulin load. Now, in their case, it's produced by their own pancreas. Because of their insulin resistance and their unnatural, unhealthy, excessively high-carb diet, their poor pancreas is forced to dump out prodigious amounts of insulin. In many type 2 diabetics, their pancreas is not their problem. Let me repeat that. For many type 2 diabetics, probably most but not all, and only your doctor can tell you this, their pancreas is not their problem. Often it works just fine. In fact, it's overworking and pumping its little guts out trying to keep up with the huge carbohydrate load that these diabetics are forcing into their bodies. Dr. Michael Leeds writes this, In the appropriate amount, insulin keeps the metabolic system humming along smoothly with everything in balance. But in great excess, it becomes a rogue hormone ranging throughout the body, wreaking metabolic havoc and leaving a trail of chaos and disease in its wake. So the danger for diabetics is coming from two sources, high glucose and high insulin. And from these two roots, all the horrific complications spring forth. People die, they lose their eyesight, their legs, they have heart attacks and strokes, their veins collapse, they get all kinds of infections and sores that will not heal. In my early struggles with metabolic syndrome, my A1C was still in the so-called normal range. My fasting glucose was not considered diabetic. But I was having all kinds of problems. Urinary tract infections, irritable bowel syndrome, frozen shoulders, hypos, arthritis. I fainted once. I had shaking and trembling spells all the time. The doctors were telling me I was not diabetic. But I had serious insulin resistance and terrible blood sugar spikes that could rise over 200 an hour after eating and then plunge down to around 40 or so three hours later. This wasn't the result of constantly elevated glucose that was causing most of my problems, but it was the result of terrible glucose spikes plus excess insulin that I was living with every day. Let's imagine you go to a doctor's office and he tells you you have the terrible disease of craniopericarditis. <laughs> now, you've never heard of that, but it, it sure sounds scary. You ask the doctor, are you sure? And he tells you in a sad voice, 
Yes, it's definite. I hated to tell you, but you had to know. So you say to your doctor, well, I've never heard of cranial parentitis. What does it do? Will I die soon? He says, no, actually, you should live out your years with this. It doesn't kill you or even shorten your life. So you say, well, what does it do? Will I go blind? Will I lose my legs? Will it destroy my organs? What are the effects? What are the complications of this disease? And he tells you, well, actually, there are no negative effects at all. As far as we know, it doesn't harm you physically in any way. <laughs> well, you look at the doctor in amazement. You say to him, well, why in the world are you sitting there looking so sad? It doesn't kill me. It doesn't harm me in any way. What kind of crazy, crazy disease is that? Well, the truth is, there would be no reason for fear or even having the slightest concern if you had a disease which did not shorten your life and created zero symptoms or complications. Now, here's a question for you. What if diabetes was like that? You say, yeah, but it's not. There are terrible complications from diabetes, and it can very easily shorten your life. Well, yes, it can. But remember, the reason that diabetes is so deadly is due to two things, high glucose and high insulin. If you could just put an end to the high glucose and the high insulin, you'd be in the clear. If you want to call yourself a diabetic, fine, but as long as you keep those glucose levels in line and your insulin low, you have an affliction which will not shorten your life and will not give you any kind of physical complications or have any harmful effects whatsoever. So the million dollar question is, is there anything, any medicine, any diet, any exercise, any practice at all that will effectively bring my glucose levels and my insulin levels down into the normal range and thereby take that stinger out of diabetes and render it harmless? And the answer is a big fat yes. There is something that will do both. It doesn't cost money. It doesn't require you to be a genius to start using it. And it is freely available. And that answer to both conditions, high glucose and high insulin, is the low-carb diet along with time-restricted eating, which some call intermittent fasting. Now, by low carb, I'm not just talking about you refusing donuts and no longer eating German chocolate cake. Low carb means slashing most of the carbohydrates in your diet. The pasta, the bread, potatoes, rice, nearly all grains, all pastries, all sugar, all fruit juice, most fruits, except for berries and avocados, maybe tomatoes sometimes. It means cutting out starches, sugars, and carbs. And given enough time for the process to work, and combining your low-carb diet with narrowing that window of eating to, say, six hours each day, you will never again go through your days with raging insulin. You'll never again wake up to glucose levels at 150, 200, 250 or higher. You'll watch your A1C drop down from double digits into the sixes, the fives, or for some, even the fours. If you're a type 1, you'll be able, under your doctor's care and supervision, to drop your insulin levels much lower than you thought possible and still get better A1Cs than you used to have back in the diabetic lifestyle that you had. Time-restricted eating is trickier for type 1, so don't just jump into that. Talk to your doctor about it. But by all means, cut those carbs. You'll find that you can far more accurately dose your mealtime insulin and you'll rejoice to discover that raging glucose spikes and terrible hypos will nearly be a thing of the past. And if you don't believe me, read and learn from Dr. Richard Bernstein, who is a type 1 himself, and he's in his 80s, and he keeps his A1C score in the 4s. Now, if you're a type 2, you will thrill that very first time when your morning fasting blood sugar drops below 100. You'll find that the low-carb diet can still taste really great. And the satisfaction of getting post-meal blood sugar peaking at 125 or 133 will be a high that no donut or bowl of mac and cheese could ever give you. So what does beating diabetes look like? It looks like this, living into old age with good mobility, keeping your eyesight, keeping your legs, your kidneys working beautifully, your liver in fine shape. No more numbness in your extremities, no more constant infections, no constant urination, finding that your sores and cuts heal up quickly and completely within a couple of weeks. 
Now, if you're eating low carb with, say, no more than 50 or 60 grams of carbs per day, with most of those carbs coming from vegetables and salads, and you still need to take medications or even insulin, then, of course, just do it. Beating diabetes doesn't necessarily mean that you refuse to ever take medications or insulin. Sometimes, diabetics have burned out most of their beta cells in their pancreas, and they just have to take insulin or medication. In their case, they're not dealing with too much insulin. They've got too little insulin. Their pancreas just isn't putting it out. And it only makes sense that they'd need to supplement or stimulate their body's natural insulin. But so what? There's nothing wrong with that. Some people feel like it would be the end of the world if they had to inject insulin. But the truth is that's nothing. If that's what it takes for you to live into your 80s or 90s and keep your legs and kidneys and eyes and enjoy the life God has given you on this beautiful earth, my friend, that is a small price to pay. If a doctor said to me, Dennis, your pancreas is barely functioning. You'll have to start injecting insulin regularly. I would do it in a heartbeat. It would be a small price to pay for my health and to enjoy a long, active, healthy life. But you can be sure that if I did have to inject insulin, I would never, let me say it again, I would never use that as an excuse to pig out on pasta and bread and rice and chocolate cake and snicker bars and guzzle sodas all day long. I'd still eat low carb. In fact, I'd probably lower my carbs even more than I do now and simply match small amounts of insulin with my low carb meals. And I would call that beating diabetes. And for type 2 diabetics with good pancreatic function but who are dealing with insulin resistance, the answer is still a low-carb diet and time-restricted eating. Whatever your diabetic situation, you can quiet the storm of raging high blood sugar and raging high insulin levels with a diet that does not provoke those two things, and that means slashing the carbohydrates that have brought you to the edge of disaster. And as you do this and allow time to bring about your healing, the storm will become silent. The winds and the flames of diabetes will weaken and die. And you'll have the thrill of beating a bully that has been thought unbeatable. I've been watching a documentary that aired on PBS, which they titled Blood Sugar Rising, America's Hidden Diabetes Epidemic. It's been interesting, and they did a pretty good job in much of what they presented. I didn't agree with everything that was said or implied, of course, but it's definitely worth the watch. In this video, I'll share a few of the things they said, and we'll take a good look at one of their main premises with which I totally agree, and that is that the rate of the growth of diabetes in the U.S. is blowing through the roof. If I knew very little about diabetes and its effects and its prevalence, after watching this video, I would come to the conclusion that diabetes is a really big deal. And that, of course, is undeniably true. It is a big deal. It's a big deal because of how many people have it. It's a big deal because of how it's growing exponentially across the world. And it's a big deal because of how devastating it can be to your health. Anyone who takes diabetes lightly is just flat out ignorant. And anyone who's told they're even pre-diabetic and doesn't take it seriously or make any effort to change the trajectory of their life and their health is most foolish indeed. The documentary declares that in America alone, there are an estimated 100 million people with diabetes and prediabetes. They predict that this number will explode and that half the U.S. population will have diabetes or prediabetes by the year 2025. Now, that's just five years away. And if that's true, that is absolutely staggering. The current population of the U.S. is 328 million. So this means that right now, not quite one in three Americans has either diabetes or prediabetes. And if you were to look more carefully into metabolic syndrome, which develops well before glucose levels get out of control, almost surely about half the population of the U.S. has metabolic problems and is on the path to diabetes, heart disease, high blood sugar, and so forth. In short, despite all of our advances in medicine, despite all of our amazing hospitals, 
and amazing doctors and nurses and health experts, despite all the health and fitness books, TV shows, and YouTube videos, the health of the American people is atrocious. This documentary makes a good case for the fact that it didn't used to be this bad. One person reported a generation ago, less than 3% of Americans had diabetes. Today, it's almost 10%. One doctor who was interviewed said, When I started out as a young doctor, about 1 in 20 of my patients had type 2 diabetes. Now, it's 1 in 2. What in the world is going on? Dan Hurley, a science journalist, said this, 150 years ago, a doctor could go most of their career and maybe see one or two people with diabetes. It was just considered a very rare disease, and it had been since ancient times. Now, this was not news to me, but one thing they stated did take me by surprise. They made the point that it's not just type 2 diabetes that's growing exponentially. Even type 1 diabetes is multiplying like crazy. Dan Hurley stated, Everybody knows that type 2 diabetes has been increasing. What most people don't get is that type 1, what used to be called childhood onset diabetes, has been increasing at the same rate. When I developed type 1 diabetes in 1975, I didn't meet anyone else who had that disease at my college. I didn't meet friends. I didn't have family who had type 1 diabetes. Today, I know so many people with type 1. Not because I wrote a book about it, but my neighbor down the block, the girl around the corner, the editor of my local paper, the priest at my church. Well, I've always assumed that type 1 diabetes was sort of a freak autoimmune issue that was totally inexplicable and unrelated to lifestyle issues. If you develop type 1 diabetes, you were just unlucky. Type 2 diabetes is an entirely different ball game. But if this documentary is correct and type 1 diabetes really is increasing at the same rate as type 2 diabetes, there may be more lifestyle issues behind it than most of us had previously thought. But I'm not going to comment any more on that. I'd like to see more statistics from varied sources in order to be convinced that this is true. But if it is, and the rate of type 1 diabetes is increasing at the same rate as type 2, there are some profound implications in that. But let's deal with what we know for sure. Type 2 diabetes is increasing like crazy, not just in the U.S., but in most of the world. Diabetes is all over India, all over Australia, all over the U.K. And from the comments that are left under my videos, I have to believe it's a major problem in Pakistan, in most of the Middle Eastern countries, and pretty much everywhere else in the world. The coronavirus has been called a pandemic, but you could almost say the same thing about diabetes. Diabetes is not contagious, of course, but the lifestyle that creates diabetes is contagious. Now, I said at the beginning that in the midst of this epidemic, there is some wonderful and some great news, and I want to talk about that now. If you really understand how diabetes works, it can give you hope to learn that diabetes is and has been rapidly increasing in our world. You say, how can you see any hope in that? Okay, here's the deal. If diabetes was not increasing and had never increased, if the rate of diabetes has always remained locked steady in our world, say at 2% of the world's population, we wouldn't really have much of a reason to hope for any improvement in our own lives. We could only hope in our youth that we would fall in the lucky 98% and not fall into the unlucky 2% that get diabetes. If in the days of Moses, for example, 2% of the world had diabetes, and in the days of the apostles, 2% of the world had diabetes, and in the days of the French Revolution, 2% of the world had diabetes, and the days of Abraham Lincoln, 2%, and the days of our grandparents, 2% had diabetes, and today 2% of the world had diabetes, we'd just have to consider type 2 diabetes as a totally genetic disease that had nothing to do with lifestyle. Furthermore, we'd have no reason to suppose that any change of lifestyle would make any significant difference. Regardless of your diet, regardless of your weight, regardless of your activity level, regardless of whether you live mostly on cinnamon rolls or mostly on salads, 
your chances of getting diabetes would be exactly the same. Two out of every 100 would be losers in the genetic lottery. 98 out of 100 would be winners. But it's not that way. Everybody knows that the rate of diabetes has skyrocketed in the last generation or perhaps the last generation and a half. And as I said, that gives us hope. There must be something we've been doing differently in the last 75 years or so that is affecting our health. Is it wearing Nike running shoes? Grandpa never wore those. No, I don't think that's it. Is it using our cell phones? Are they responsible for all this diabetes? Uh, I don't think so. But what some sharp doctors and researchers have figured out is that this explosion of diabetes has to do with the foods that we put in our mouths. We simply don't eat the way our great-grandparents ate. We eat far more carbohydrates than they did. We eat far more fruit than they did. We eat an enormous amount of sugar and foods with added sugar, which they would never have dreamed of eating. Now, I'm persuaded that it is this glut of excess carbohydrates and tons of sugar which are the primary culprit that has led to an explosion of diabetes. But once you understand this and you really get it, you get excited because there is nobody forcing us to eat this way. Not our mamas, not our daddies, not our neighbors. Nobody's forcing us. And we can undo this situation anytime we want. And if this premise is correct, that our world is drowning in an ocean of carbohydrates, it follows that as soon as we cut most of those carbs out of our diet, we should see our health and our glucose levels returning to normal. And of course, the other thing is to simply stop eating so much and so often. And that brings us right back to, you guessed it, a low-carb diet and time-restricted eating and occasional day-long fasting. And lo and behold, we're hearing of testimonies by the thousands from people who have made these changes in their lifestyle and their glucose levels and their A1C scores dropped right down into normal levels within a few months or perhaps a year. So here's the newsflash. The rate of diabetes is not static. It is rapidly increasing, and that must mean there is a lifestyle component involved. All we have to do is identify that lifestyle component that is creating all this mess and then make the appropriate changes and we'll see amazing victory in our lives. And that, of course, is what this Beat Diabetes YouTube channel is all about. All right, let me share a few thoughts on some of the other quotes from this documentary. It's called Blood Sugar Rising, America's Hidden Diabetes Epidemic. A lot that was said, I agree with, but some things I had a bit of a problem with. Here's one statement by Dr. Enrique Caballero with which I totally agree. He says diabetes is truly a silent disease. It could take up to 15 years for someone with diabetes to develop the first symptoms that are related to high blood sugar levels. Well, he's absolutely right. You can have diabetes or you can be moving toward diabetes for over a decade before you see any problematic symptoms. This is why everyone needs to get regular A1C tests. And not only that, we need to test our glucose after our meals to see how extreme our blood sugar spikes are. Anyone who can spike up to 180 or 200 milligrams per deciliter after any meal has some problems. Now, it may take you a decade or more to get a full-scale diagnosis of diabetes, but that doesn't mean you're not hurting yourself right now. Some of the smartest people I run across in the comments under my videos are those who say, I don't have diabetes, but I want to eat right so that I never get it. Very, very smart. Now, here's a statement that was in the documentary that I don't entirely agree with. They refer to diabetes as a chronic disease that is notoriously difficult to control. Okay, I understand where they're coming from. For many people, it is difficult to control, and for some, it seems nearly impossible. But for most type 2 diabetics... My, in my opinion, it's not all that hard to control. The principle is simple enough. Cut your carbs, restrict your window of eating, and watch your glucose levels drop. And if they're not dropping much after several months or they're not dropping fast enough, cut your carbs some more and narrow that window of eating a bit more. 
Now, if you say, I'm eating almost no carbs, my window of eating is four to six hours each day, and I've been doing this for many months, and I still see almost no progress, well, then it's time to find out what your pancreas is doing and whether it's putting out enough insulin. You might be a type 1 diabetic, or you might be a LADA or a type 1.5. So find out where you stand by going to a good endocrinologist. And if you need to take insulin, then take it. <laughs> Let me repeat that. If you need to take insulin, then take it. But I've heard so many testimonies from people who've suddenly found victory over high glucose, sometimes after going years seeing no victory, that I have to believe that for most type 2 diabetics, diabetes is not difficult to beat. Sure, it takes some time and some sacrifices, but so does getting a college degree, or training for an athletic competition, or learning the skills to be a plumber. Often our problem is simply a lack of motivation to make the changes we know we need to make. We think, I want victory over diabetes, but I want to enjoy my big spaghetti dinners. Or, I want an A1C in the fives, but I cannot give up my apple pie. Or, I'll never stop eating rice, or I'd rather die than do without baked potatoes. Or don't ask me to de deny myself my orange juice. And yes, in those cases, when you're determined to hang on to a lot of food that's doing the exact opposite of what you want it to do, diabetes is very, very difficult to control. In fact, I would say it's almost impossible. Another statement I cringed at was this one. Exciting new progress in drugs and technologies have made the disease more manageable. Okay, I'll admit, if they're talking about a continual glucose monitor, well, that's a technology that is exciting, although I've never used one. But what's exciting to me is to beat this monster so thoroughly, you no longer need the drugs. Don't tell me about all kinds of exciting new drugs. Let's talk about a new lifestyle and way of eating. And we're hearing testimonies like this nearly every single day. If you need drugs, by all means take them, but as you make the lifestyle changes you need to make, you'll probably hear your doctor telling you, well, I think we can take you off this drug or off that medication. And hopefully in time you can have a celebration party where you celebrate the fact that you can keep your glucose normal without any drugs at all. And that, my friend, is truly worth celebrating.